Hello everyone. So um, I spent a good last week working on the Marvin project. So the reason why I worked on the Marvin project was to actually start looking into how we can do validation better. So it turns out towards the end of the exercise, the week plus long exercise, it turns out that hey, I'm actually um, work towards what I feel would be a good way of structuring our code. And it's actually inspired by Uncle Bob's talk on the clean architecture, which I'll talk more about it in subsequent slides. So for the people who are watching this video who are not familiar with Marvin, and also for people over here if you're not familiar with Marvin, so what is Marvin? So Marvin, when we built Marvin, we wanted a chatbot interface that would be able to talk to different um, chat clients, and it will be backed by the same backend application. So what does it mean? So let's say we have, uh, over here I have Slack and Telegram. So Marvin will sit in the middle between um, the chat client and your app. So let's say you use Slack, you issue a command on Slack. Slack will send a request to the app. And in this case, it's Marvin. And Marvin will send a request to your application. And your application will respond back to Marvin. Marvin will just proxy it back to Slack. So this in a nutshell is what Mar Marvin does. And uh, for this exercise, we'll be looking at a particular feature of Marvin, which is um, this particular use case that I've illustrated over here, which is simply to receive a request from a chat client, forward it to a remote service, receive the response from a remote service, and forward it back to Slack. So this use case will be the one in particular that we'll be looking at for this video. So as I was saying, how it got started. So I was actually researching on how we can do validations better. And since we were building in Spring, we actually looked at um, how you actually do validations in Spring. Because most likely, Spring has their own opinionated ways of doing validations. So I was looking at the Spring guides, and this is what I got. Uh, so first, you need to implement the validator interface. And then you have a constructor, in this case, a customer has address, so it takes in the address validator as well. Do some checks, um, check that it actually supports the validator, it supports the class, and there's the constructor, and then you, there's a few methods that you need to implement when you have validator. One is supports, to make sure that it actually supports the object you're validating against. So you just check that um, it's assignable from this particular class, trying to look at, and then that's where the meat of the work is being done, the validation. So over here in the Spring Guide example, we're just saying that, oh, um, I'm going to check our first name for rejected if that's empty or white space, similarly for surname, and then I'm going to do a validation for the address. So that's, in a nutshell, how Spring Guide actually recommends how you do validation. And it got me thinking, that looks like um, quite a bit of code. And well, they have their good intentions for separating out in a validator. So I suppose they are trying to adhere to uh, the single responsibility principle, whereby they have the validator class just do the validations and leave it out of the object, which I believe is fine. Well, coming from the Rails background and experience working with Rails, I do like the uh, convenience of having it define a class, so I know right away what is being validated. And that got me thinking, can we do something similar to that as well? Sorry, just a clarification. When you say define the class, you mean you like your entity to be able to do its own validation? Not just to do its own validations. I would be able to tell at a glance what fields are being validated, because right. not necessarily all fields are being but validated. So you like the DSL, and you like that the DSL is part of active model validations. Yep. Yep. So it got me thinking, like, can we do better than this? And that's where I find out that, hey, there's actually a way of doing annotation style validations. And that's using Java X or validations. And that's the time to call for code. So let's look at some code that um, I've written. Not this class. There will be the kind of Slack request. Okay. So this is what um, I come up with. And uh, in Java X style validations, you are given this uh, annotations, not blank is one of them. You do have uh, annotations such as not now, not empty. And you, can, you can even validate against a pattern as well to make sure that a particular string matches a regex pattern. 
and there's even credit card lengths if you are interested and to validating against credit card details so on and so forth and um, these annotations actually allows you to pass in the error message that you want to show and what I like about this as I mentioned is you can see at a glance what fields are being um, validated in this case uh, this object is pretty much just a DTO so it's very simple whatever fields that comes in from a hash if the key is not there I'm going to set it to now and then if I were to call valid, um, if I were to run the validations on this object it would tell me which validation will fail so what I'm actually not showing over here is I also created a um, base class over here called validation object. What this does is uh, just give me nice uh, methods that cause is valid. And this just do the internal wiring up of uh, the validators, collecting all the arrows and checking whether it's valid or not. So it's pretty simple. And if you were to look at the um, Spring validator. So if you were to go for the uh, spring validator approach, your class will probably look something like this without the annotations, but then you end up having the uh, validator class. And in the validate method, you have to use the validation utils to call multiple times on that. Any questions so far based on what you see? Is that clear? I have questions, but I don't want to derail you. So I'm going to okay. wait until the end. Sure. I actually have a question. Yep. Can you explain a bit more how you're using validation object? Or is that a bunch of um, It's actually part of my implementation. So what validation object allows you to do is allows you to call invoke is valid and is invalid methods on the object you're validating instead of creating a validator class passing it in and doing it for you I'm doing the same way over here as well for the uh, example I'm using Spring's validator framework as well so if you look at this it extends for a validation object in this case it actually picks up the validator over here so in this case, um, this is actually a quick example to illustrate that you can actually have validation object support either ways as well. And over here, I'm just hard coding the validator that we need in this case, which I believe you can inject it or just have a way to define it from the uh, implementation class as well. In, in this particular case, it's hard coded to a particular type, right, to incoming Slack device. You have a type definition D on your class, yep, correct. That class, but in this case, it's just fixed to, to provide an example of what it might look like. Yes, it will validate. The reason why um, I do a T is because um, it needs to get a handle to the target instance you're validating. Reason being, when you call validate, you actually need the reference to the object it's um, validating. So you can't really call this because this is validation object. You need the actual concrete implementation of this class. And, yep. So. Can I ask the question to make sure I understand your approach? Uh, I don't know if you can you go to the question. Okay. Uh, the question is, it looks like you're using the uh, annotation style validations which are usually used to serve as uh, you know, validation capabilities on an entity that's also doing other stuff. But you were like, no, I want to use those, that same strategy on a, on a class <coughs> that's only job is to be a validator because I like that DSL if you were better. Yep. Is that right? Correct. Okay, cool. So, um, so just to run through some of the benefits of doing that. So it actually gives you a clear correlation between what is being validated and you can see at a glance what fields on this class needs to be validated just by the annotations itself. And it forces you to declare these validations up front. And it's clear to someone who's looking at the fields, oh, some of these fields need validation. And uh, you can even have methods that has uh, these annotations as well. So one thing in the last point is actually eliminates the possibility of typo. So if you were to look at the example that I show you, In the validator, 
you actually need to uh, pass in a string. And this string is actually the field name that you need. So what happens if, if I have fat fingers and I type in the wrong name, and for some reason this is not being tested, and there's an error, and I'm actually forced to figure out what actually happened over here. But you don't get that issue if you were to use um, the annotation style, because it's clear which field you are being validated. So I feel that that's a big win for me. Yep. But then that got me thinking as well, can we do better than just annotation style validations? Because if you look at annotation style validations, one good thing it gives you is it tells you what individual fields need to be validated. But what happens if you have um, validation that cross cuts across different fields and you have associations and you need to validate against? As I was thinking about this, I was looking at the Marvin code. So let's look at the Marvin code to actually give you a rough idea on what I'm talking about. And for this, I'll be looking at a controller. And this controller is the uh, use case I was talking about, index that receives um, the request from Slack. So over here, I have the same um, DTO that I was talking about previously, the incoming Slack request. So actually, um, it receives the parameters and also takes in a select token, which will be validating. And then it calls is valid. So this is the method that's provided by the validation object. And then it checks if there's error for this. I'm going to throw an unrecognized API token. So this is the first step of refactor that I did after introducing uh, this uh, DTO and having validations on this DTO as well. And as I was thinking about it and looking through it, hey, um, the original piece of code, and if I were to show you, actually looks like this. When a request comes in, I'm going to check for the token. If it's not there or if it's not equal to the select token, throw the exception. And I check that there's a text there. If it's empty, I'm going to return a default response. Otherwise, I'm going to pass the commands that it's sent from a check client. And then I ask if the command exists in my system. If it doesn't, return a res uh, default response. And then this bit of code, what it's checking is checks if there are subcommands. And then it asks if subcommands are present. If it if it's not, return a default response. And finally, uh, it starts to pass the arguments sent uh, sent as part of the command. And if it fails passing, I'm going to return a response. And then finally, this is where the remote service is called. So you can see that we've actually gone through like um, probably 20 to 30 lines of code just for the validation bits. And as I was thinking about this, it seems like there are certain things that may not be a good approach when you use validation style, um, annotation style validations. Things like this part, where passing fails. This should, by right, be a validation as well, because you are checking whether particular arguments can be passed. And then you have... Um, some sort of validation that check whether subcommands exist in a database. Similarly, for commands as well, we're checking against the database as well. Okay. And it got me thinking, hey, seems to be a pattern around this, right? Because there is a particular type of validations that's structural, and that means uh, things like checking that a string is not blank, the date string actually matches a particular regex pattern. And there is the different type, which is the domain level validations, where you're checking whether there is a common object that exists, and you do have some uniqueness check as well. Yep. So let's go back to the code and see if we can identify quickly which uh, type of validation this falls in. So for this part, which type of validation do you guys think that it falls in? Structural. I think it's both. The first part is structural. Checking whether it's now is structural. But then the, the second part, checking whether it goes to the select token in the system, it actually uh, that falls in domain. Yeah. Oh, this part? 
structural. Yep, it's clearly structural to me as well. This part. <coughs> yeah, because this is tied to your entity that you have. You need to look up the database, checking that whether the command is present. Similarly, this part, same check, checking against database. And I feel that this falls into the domain level validations. And then uh, passing it, yeah, this clearly I feel is uh, domain level as well. Well, we can argue that uh, it may fall into structural, but then because it has to do a lookup, several steps of lookup before that, in order for you to achieve um, this check or whether it's able to pass. So I feel that it falls under domain level as well. Let's go back to the slides. So as I was thinking about this, and um, Gabe happened to share earlier, he was talking about hexagonal architecture, where you show a prototype of how we could actually split up in terms of uh, having objects to do certain tasks and having like models, having a lot of behavior code in the models itself and asking the model to do certain tasks. You, have, you structure your code such that you have uh, use cases whereby you have business use cases and you create classes based on this business use cases. For this case, a particular use case would probably be made remo make remote API call. There would probably be a use case for this. And then I was thinking, hey, why not put those domain validations in these use cases and then leave the structural validations at the control layer because that's what is being sent to us. Why not just do those structural valid validations at a step? And if you look at this diagram, as I was saying, um, in a green layer where our controller sits, that will do the structural val validations. And then in the red layer where the use cases sit, that would be uh, the domain validations. So in this case, you actually remove the amount of churn that you normally have in probably the entities or even uh, the controllers as well, because that will be the bulk of uh, the validations in the previous version of this code that I was showing you. Because right now, we do see a lot of validations happening in the controllers based on the code I show you. Yeah, so that got me thinking, asking this question, and that's where this journey begins because uh, it took me a while to actually do some refactoring, and um, this bit will be more on uh, sharing what I've learned. And this is the part where I will sit down and we'll walk through the code. Before we do that, do you guys have any questions so far? That's good. I have yes? A question. Maybe you can data, mm -hmm. but. Um, if you separate out the structural validations from the domain validations, yep. your domain layer, if it's sitting in its own service, right, mm -hmm. talks to these controllers over the wire. Right. Mm -hmm. So how do you guarantee that what the controller is sending you is actually structurally sound if it's uh, getting transmitted over the wire? Um, and does that mean you need to have those validations inside of the use cases, inside of the domain as well? So you are saying that if the controller is in one service and then the use case is in another service? Yeah, and you lose that uh, type safety that you have when everything's like separated out in packages, but it contains the same box. Right? Um, mm -hmm. Just thinking along those lines. So, uh, for one, I'm not sure which scenario you would do that, where you split up the controllers and the service, but then to address that part, what you could do is actually you, um, you code based on abstractions. So you work with interfaces instead. Mm -hmm. So both sides know of these interfaces that you're going to pass in, like a, somewhat like a request right. interface that I'm talking about. And it has methods like, is valid. So when you pass it to the use cases, what you could just do for a check is call is valid on this object you're just passing to me, just to ensure that it's in the right state. Or maybe you can have some contact tests. <coughs> yep. Ensure that they are good. Can I contribute one thought to the discussion? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think your scenario matters, if I'm understanding it correctly, because the reason why we do the validations is so that we can tell the user, you fuck something up, I don't know how to handle this data, right? So the, the controller can handle that and pass that back to the user. 
if the controller ends up somehow after that point passing us back stuff to a different service that's not doing the structural validations, it's just going to throw an exception at some point, right? And that's fine. That's fine because the contracts between the service that's doing the domain stuff, and in this case, the other service that was just doing the uh, structural validation is, you pass me legit data, dude. If right. you don't, you're going to give an exception for me, and that's your business that you want to parse it. Right, so you can't enforce that contract uh, on a code level unless you have these shared interfaces or something. Sure. But the contract is, you will get an exception data. Yeah, okay. exactly. I think that's the difference between uh, data that you can control and data that you can't. So in this case, data you receive from a user, uh, I would say you be more strict and check what's needed. Whereas data among the service that you own, you can be a bit more lax and uh, do certain checks, as I mentioned to you. Uh, check that is valid before you actually do any operations on it. Yep. And let's look at some code. Let me check out my branch. So I've shown you how uh, the code before the refactor looks like, and this is what after refactor looks like. So similarly, I will still have um, validations, the structural validation done on the incoming Slack request. And if it's invalid, OK, I'm going to return a response. And this is what uh, in Uncle Bob's um, blog, he talks about interface adapters, whereby you use the adapter pattern, wrap around objects, and cherry pick whichever fields that you need for the uh, next, uh, next layer. In this case, the next layer will be the uh, use case, which uh, in my code, I'm calling it interaction. So as you can see, what I'm going to do is after wrapping around incoming requests, this is actually an interface, and I'm going to pass it into the use case. And this is the use case where the meat of uh, this operation is doing, create a use case. And I'm also injecting in the service and the repository for the service to work. And for the validations, the domain validations that what I'm doing, I'm actually creating decorators. And what do this decorator look like? So this decorator would implement these uh, same methods as uh, a normal interaction, which is run. So actually, does the uh, usual validations that we've seen in the first part of code, checking whether is it present, checking if the subcommand is present, and then subsequently check whether the passing works. And if all of this is successful, I'm just going to call the decorated object. So if you look at the previous bit of code, the decorator object is actually the use case, the one that uh, actually does the work. So what I'm doing over here with the decorators, which um, this approach was something that I experimented with, and I thought that is probably pretty clear to split out what type of validations we're working with. So over here, I have uh, validations just for argument passing, and I have another validations just for the uh, verify API token step. And uh, what this decorator pattern actually gives you is also get to define which uh, validations have to run first. So over here, I kind of put, I created the uh, verify API token decorator last because I want, it, I want this check to be done first. Similarly to, uh, similar to the previous version of this code before the refactor, the API token check is always done first. Do you think it's a little bit confusing that it happens in the opposite order because you're wrapping and wrapping? Yes. Uh, so that's one thing that I feel there's still some room to improve. Yeah. So um, this a but I feel that this is a good first step in terms of splitting them up into their own yeah. concerns and responsibility. Yeah. Because uh, if you look at individual decorators, the run method and the validation, they are really short and um, it's maintainable yeah. and. You don't need to change this. And the good thing about this is you can reuse these decorators in subsequent interactions that you have as well. Absolutely. OK, and uh, finally, course run. And this is another interface adapter, which is the outgoing Slack response. So based on uh, the interactions results, 
I'm going to wrap around it and I'm going to expose what is needed to the client and return the call back to the chat client. And there's one bit of code that I haven't showed, which is the uh, make remote API call. So what this means is actually gives us pretty straightforward call to make the uh, remote API service. So this operation, if you look at a previous version of code, it was actually all the way at the bottom of like 20 or 30 lines of code. But now what you can do is you can just straight away retrieve whatever entities it needs, straight away pass it, because the validations have already been done by the previous decorators, and then just call it right away. And you can just return the result that you need over here. Which I feel, it gives you clear understanding on what is needed over here in this interaction. And in terms of testing, it's pretty straightforward what you need to set up. And uh, because of the assumptions that we've already made, that there already exists a command, there are arguments created, and um, the arguments are in a possible state. Before I continue, is there any questions? I will dive a lot, um, a little bit deeper into some of the pieces of code that may look unfamiliar to you in subsequent slides. Before we proceed, any questions or anything that you want to look at? Any particular bits of code that you want to look at in particular? No? Okay. So, some learnings that I've come across while doing this refactor is um, use uh, data transfer objects when you cross boundaries between, between layers. In the code, you can see that um, I do have incoming select request. So this is a DTO. Similarly, uh, outgoing select response. It's a DTO of sorts, but it's more like an adapter. And then I have another adapter. So it's um, creating really small, simple implementations. If you look at implementation of select interaction requests, it just has a bunch of get methods that fetch what is needed for the interaction to work. And internally, it has a Slack text parser that what it does is just um, breaks up the command into tokens and then returns it back. So there's not a lot of um, logic happening. It's just uh, really simple returning whatever that the interaction needs based on um, what is being passed in. And once you have the DTOs, what you could do is just perform the structural validations on these DTOs. Because these DTOs, what it does is just having those fields, and you can just add the annotations that you need on those fields that you want to be validated. So it's pretty clear on this DTO what is necessary to ensure that a program will work. Okay. And I uh, also use um, adapter objects to actually pick the fields that I need for the next layer so that I don't expose unnecessary information to uh, subsequent inner layers as you move towards the core of the onion, if I put it that way. So in a way, you are actually... Um, so this is a way of doing uh, information hiding, hiding whatever that's not necessary. And also you can do some like uh, translation or mapping in terms of information that you can prepare for the next layer that they need. And uh, one thing that come along the way, which I find it helpful, was uh, to enforce preconditions. So what are preconditions? Let's look at the code. So over here, for instance, on a Slack interaction request, I have some preconditions check. So this preconditions class is actually um, provided by Guava. If you were to look at implementation for check not now, it just throws the null pointer exception if whatever um, object reference that you pass in is null. Otherwise, it just returns it. So it just ensures that the collaborators that they are passing into this class is actually in a state that the uh, class would need. So over here in the Slack interaction request, I just have to make sure two things. One is it's not null, and uh, it's in a valid state. So what precondition does is um, it's actually one of the items in design by contract, whereby you have a contract to say that, oh, what this method needs uh, actually needs incoming Slack requests. And 
what is the state that you need incoming Slack requests to be in order for this class to work. And these are the two preconditions that I need. One is not now, and the uh, object Slack request is actually valid. So in a way, actually, um, what this gives you is actually, in a way, it actually helps you to narrow down every time you see bugs within your code. Because what this precondition check is to guard against runtime exceptions, whereby you have like null pointer exception, but you have to go through dig, dig through like many levels of stack trace and not find where it is, and it's not readable. So this is especially the case when you are going through, um, you're running the code and you're testing it, doing some exploratory testing, and it just crashed, and you have uh, to go through, scroll through the many, many levels of stack trace and not find where exactly it is. So over here actually gives you like a nice message that you can pass in and to say what is the exact error and based on this stack trace you can actually know which file is actually throwing this error. Yes, you have a question. Is this three conditions almost equal to the structural validations that you spoke about? So yeah. um, there's a difference. So preconditions is something that we check against uh, developer errors whereby people who are using this object, they are not adhering to this contract that you have uh, set up. So let's say you would have this class being documented somewhere in the documentation, and you say that you need um, the incoming select request for this constructor. And the uh, it documentation will say that, hey, uh, I would throw the null pointer exception if uh, this is now, and I would throw the uh, check argument, which is the illegal argument exception error, if you're passing me a uh, incoming select request that is not valid. So this is slightly different from um, the validations that um, I showed you in the select controller. Because what yeah, those... actually don't throw an exception, you come back saying, hey, please enter your name. Yep. So there's a difference between these two is because um, the reason why you don't throw an exception when you do structural validations on a step is because if you were to throw exceptions, that means that the user who's using a system, they can't do any action to actually rectify it yeah. because it's a system error that's facing. But over here, within the code base itself, these are errors that you want developer to look at and fix immediately. And it's something that we could handle ourselves. Yep. I have a question. Do you consider using annotations like not none uh, for your argument set? Because I think they do yes. the same thing. They respond yes. to the thing. Um, the reason why I ask is because I know I'm not null guards you against uh, before you, you run this thing, you, won't, you will see the compiler tell you as a warning that you're passing in, in a lot. Yep, uh, that's uh, one way as well because I do see people using it. Mm -hmm. But um, I feel that what helps is uh, the message that we pass in at the top. And what one thing, one advantage that Guava gives, Guava's precondition gives you is you are able to interpolate any uh, parameters that you need. So let's say you want right. to show the state of this object, you can actually call, I think it's percent %s, and then you pass in the object that you want to it. So this is something that the uh, normal assert in uh, the Java library assert that. So this is something that Java provides you out of the box, but it doesn't give you this interpolation. And um, one thing that I like about having these preconditions is, you can see at a glance what needs to be there. And uh, you actually have a lot of uh, freedom in terms of defining what type of uh, checks that you can do. Because you can do like quite a bit of this. And not just that, you can invoke your own methods that you want to check against as well. That is comparing to the application style. And um, while going through the code, you may have seen this uh, builder pattern. And uh, I felt that it's really useful, especially when you have a lot of arguments and you pass in a constructor. Because uh, in Java language, there isn't like name arguments that actually tells you what you're passing in a constructor. And sometimes you're relying a lot on ID to tell you what's the name of the uh, argument that you need to pass in. Even though that helps, but then it doesn't really tell you much about what is name that you're passing. Like whose name are you talking about? Okay, so some places where I've used um, the builder pattern is when building my 
interaction result, uh, for instance, the simplest one over here, where I'm calling builder. Um, there are different approaches of doing this. So this is actually inspired by uh, Joshua Bloch's book on effective Java, so where he came out, suggested using this pattern. And this is the one that he suggested, where you have a class within it. And it basically just defines setters for the properties that you have on the outside. And over here, I do provide some nice um, methods that you can invoke that automatically sets like enum values for you. It's a nice pattern. Yep. Um, yeah, so uh, another popular way of doing things is uh, instead of having a class, instead of invoking on the class, you can have a uh, static and invoking the builder method. So this will return a new instance of the builder within the class itself. So now instead of calling interaction result dot uppercase builder, you can call the lowercase builder method, which would give you what you need on the outside. Um, <coughs> so uh, may I turn something wrong? Yep. I don't see where your builder is actually initialized. Ah. Um, okay, let me just get rid of this code first. So maybe I can see constructing your builder with the static builder here. So the magic happens at the step build. So what build does, it passes in the build instance to the interaction result. So the reason why you can do this is because this is actually private. <coughs> and uh, nobody can call the constructor on the interaction result. Itself. So now what this constructor do is just take whatever that the builder has set up and assign to itself. And then you have a bunch of that is as well. So what's nice about this is uh, you can even assign like um, default values over here. So yeah, if people um, do not invoke the method, but over here declare it to be final. So yeah. So yep, and uh, throughout the code, um, I've been using a lot of this, and I feel that it's a good pattern as well. Next thing um, that I come across is, well, exceptions is something that the Java community, they can't kind of decide on. Yeah. Along the way, I feel that, if possible, avoid throwing exceptions, because it kind of, uh, I feel that it's an anti-pattern, because let's say I want to present a more readable error to the user or developer, then I will need to create my own custom exception that actually uh, have reference to the object that is causing this exception, so on and so forth, and I'll do that. But instead, I can actually create a result object to actually capture this information and present it to um, if the developer or even the user itself. So if you we were to look at the previous version of the code, uh, let me look at a class that has uh, this issue, is the regex argument. Uh, over here, you can see I'm using a builder button as well. But before that, let's look at what it looks like. Let me just discard changes. Okay. So over here is doing the pass. And... Um, it will try to pass the results. And if it um, encounters any errors, you just throw a argument pass exception, which this is actually a custom defined exception. The reason being because uh, we want to have our own error message, and we also want a reference to this object so that we can poke and actually ask what state uh, is causing this error. And if you look at current style, what I do is um, I actually use a builder, a uh, result builder object, build whatever I need to in order to tell whoever in the uh, upper levels or upper layers what they need to know about this uh, result, whether it's success or failure. And um, if it fails, return another builder object that tells it it's a failure as well. And as I understand it, this makes the controller actions handle these results 
in a much more uniform fashion. Yep. Right? And because you're effectively you're getting nice quality markets from all of your interactions. You don't have to do special things for each different type of failure that might happen from different types of interactions. Yep, correct. So that's actually what you see in the uh, controller where I don't even know whether it yeah. succeeds exactly. or not. That makes your controller much simpler to read. Yep. You're actually so there's actually pushing um, some of this logic breaking out into the uh, individual classes to handle this. Then one thing I also learned along the way is uh, you handle exceptions at the right level of abstraction. So in the argument pass example that I show you, so the argument pass exceptions is throwing internal exceptions like uh, index out of bounds and um, some other exceptions as well, which is internal to the pass logic. So what you should do instead is to wrap around it, hand it back in a uh, manner that uh, subsequent objects that call pass would is able to understand. Yeah, so this is for if you were really you have to create your own exceptions. You have to handle it at the right level of abstraction. Uh, some things is while going down this approach, I also realized that, well, it is actually encouraged. It's not encouraged. It is the thing to do, which is to inject dependencies using a constructor and avoid the reliance on the framework. So this is something that uh, Uncle Bob is trying to champion, which is keep the framework out of this and actually inject whatever you need into the constructor. So what one nice plus point about this is it actually makes testing really easy. You actually keep Spring out of um, testing. And this is something that uh, Mike G, when he was here, he was telling us about as well. Don't auto wire your dependencies and um, bring Spring into the picture when you're testing, just a very simple DTO or use case itself. Because if you look at the code, individual interactions are just Kojo's. Even if you look at the most complicated one, the Make Remote API, it's just really simple Pojo with no dependency on uh, Spring or anything. And you can actually mock your service and your repository really easily uh, in this manner. And um, one thing, this is um, this learning is from actually the uh, D in solid, which is dependency inversion, which is to depend on abstractions and, rather than concretions. So one area where you can see this happening is um, in particularly the Slack controller. So over here in the decorator itself, I'm actually uh, passing in an implementation of uh, interaction and not the uh, actual I'm actually passing in the interface not the actual implementation of a make remote API call so what this gives you is um, it actually leaves whoever is uh, calling this without having to worry what um, make remote API call might uh, do in future and actually prevents you from changes because now you're actually uh, adhering to this interface, which is, I just need a method called run. So if make remote API call with other methods, as long as it has run, the decorators would know how to do their job as well. Yep, and similarly, you do see it in uh, interaction requests as well. Similarly, it's an interface. And this is being passed in to the individual um, use cases over here. And Slack interaction request is a concrete implementation. Okay, some afterthoughts. So the funny thing is, Uncle Bob actually gave a uh, talk. If you guys have watched it, it's called Architecture, The Lost Years. It was brought up during Stand Up a few times uh, in the team as well. The first time I watched it, before I actually did this refactor, I had no clue what he's talking about. I thought, hey, whatever he's trying to make um, makes sense. How difficult it is to do it. So that was my own naive uh, thought after that. After going through this exercise, there was actually a particular, um, he dedicated a few slides to this uh, hand-drawn animation, which he did, which uh, I will show you. So in the talk, he actually talks about this uh, diagram where he has user at the bottom left corner that interacts with uh, your system. Your system will be this entire thing. And delivery mechanism will be, in this case, the web. 
So the web will actually serve the request to uh, the controllers. Then that's where the controllers would handle everything from here onwards. And actually talks to interfaces, which is uh, what we did, which is to depend on the uh, abstractions. And then subsequently, the interactors. In this case, in the code base, will be interactions. Actually depends on whatever that the controller has passed in, which is in this case, the interaction request object. And then once it's done, you actually pass it down and ask the entities to do its job. Okay. So we actually made a really nice animate, uh, not animation, but just separate slides of uh, pictures where you send the request, pass the interactors, and then you call the entities to do its job. What interactor spits out is the result model, and it passes it back to the user. So as I was going through this, I realized, hey, um, so I rewatched this um, another time after doing this refactor. And actually, Sankin is, after going through the refactoring process, you actually realize, hey, whatever you're doing actually is pretty obvious when you are going through the process yourself. And actually, screams at you that certain decisions have to be made. Things like uh, depending on um, abstractions and not concretions, separating your objects into uh, smaller bits and pieces, splitting into requests and results, so on and so forth. This became obvious as you go through the refactoring process. And after watching it for a second time, I was like, hey, okay. So I actually coincident coincidentally actually adhere to what he actually su suggested and proposed during the talk. So that was pretty, uh, it's actually something which I learned along the way, which is uh, you need to just, sometimes you need to do it yourself in order to understand what's being thought, because otherwise you're just passively taking it in. And you wouldn't be able to uh, understand why certain decisions were being made and why it's been structured out that way as well. Very differently, people talk about how, you know, oftentimes our community, we get obsessed with programming design patterns, right? Mm -hmm. Design patterns are just the same thing figured out by a lot of different people. And that's exactly what happened to you. You mm -hmm. were doing this refactor and discovered the same patterns that Uncle Bob was talking about. Yep, correct. Yeah, so that was pretty neat. And uh, what lies ahead? And I feel that a few things that can be done. Actually, you can integrate this um, pattern with uh, CQRS and event sourcing. Um, that's something we didn't do in Marvin. And I feel that if we were to look at it this way, it's actually not that difficult because there's actually parallels between CQRS where it separates command and query and how we're actually doing it using this um, hexa hexagonal architecture. And you can see there's a, actually a somewhat separation between how we are doing command, where by use cases, they are actually invoking on the commands, and the read side is actually the result. And you can actually change your code to actually um, integrate with CQRS and subsequently with event sourcing as well. And uh, what actually would be nice is actually to integrate with other check clients, because that's when you know how the interfaces that you have actually uh, come up with would actually work with many more different vendors subsequently. So I guess that's it for this presentation. Thank you. Any questions? Feedback would be appreciated as well. I, I've got a question. Yes. Um, your experience with this, one of the things that, that uh, I think quite a few people normally are concerned about is um, how long it takes to develop Java software. I would. What is your gut feeling now that you know how to implement your application using this method and the way that you would have implemented it before this? Is there a perform? Is there a time penalty with one over the other, or was it same time? What, what did you What did you feel in that regard? So while working on Marvin, the uh, index method on the uh, Slack controller was something that was really. Uh, huge and uh, really monstrous whereby nobody wants to touch it and making changes to it was really difficult. Testing it was really difficult as well. So I feel that that is a smell for one, but uh, people usually would just live with it because to refactor it would actually require a lot of time. Because for me, um, I was working alone on this and I was actually refactoring it. It actually took me like a week plus to actually refactor and pull out everything to ensure that everything's working. 
uh, granted, when I was going through this exercise to look at the branch I was working on, uh, the node test, because uh, we already have the integration tests and the bits needed. And the reason why we have those integration tests was uh, because there is no way to break up the uh, method itself. Things like validations, you have to bring up Spring and actually do all those validation steps. And this was causing actually the test to run really, really slow as well. So actually moving that bit after you've done this and writing individual unit tests for the uh, interactions so are really simple and that will actually speed up the test run. So back to your question, I feel that it's something that we need to uh, take a step back and think whether when is the right point to start going down this approach? Because it's really easy for someone to actually go down the route of uh, having that index method where you throw your validations in. And what's important is having that, um, now having this knowledge is the first thing to do is how to break up into smaller interactions and how do we start to uh, draw the boundaries between how certain things should be done. So, so you, 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 set, you take this approach for your next, if you're if you doing a new project from scratch, you would take this approach? Or? Yeah, because in, in terms of testability, maintainability and readability, I feel that uh, this approach would actually trump in the long run as well. Thank you. Yay. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you.